Okay. Hello and welcome to everyone at home and in classrooms around the country to our STEM Day celebration on the EF Explore America virtual stage featuring our friend Khalif from Mass Robotics who serves as their amazing and charismatic STEM program manager. My name is Darby and I'm joined by my colleague Kate from, from EF who will be monitoring the Q&A feature. So please ask questions if you have them throughout we would love to hear from you and should be able to address those at the end. So with that said, happy National STEM and STEAM Day to everyone at Khalif. Thank you so much for being with us today and we will turn it over to you. Awesome, uh, always a pleasure to do stuff with EF. Uh, so welcome guys, I'm Khalif from Mass Robotics. Uh, Mass Robotics is one of those names that uh, before I stepped into the world of uh, the robotics industry, I had never heard of. But as you step in, uh, the whole industry is about connections with different elements. And that really goes back to what robotics is, being a, a, a whole bunch of different uh, disciplines coming together. Um, and so Mass Robotics, we do a whole bunch of things, but one of the main things is we house a, a whole bunch of robotic startups. And so we have lab space like the one you see behind me, uh, office space and such that they can use to develop their, their uh, robotic projects. Uh, as it takes a long time to incubate that kind of that kind of product, uh, and then we do a whole bunch of robotic industry stuff with uh, our partners like Amazon Robotics, like iRobot. Uh, but the most fun thing that we do is STEM, uh, and so I'm the STEM program manager, uh, and I have been here for the past three or so years. I've uh, been in this particular position for the past two, and it's been a, a real journey getting from. Uh, way back when, uh, when I knew nothing about any kind of technology, uh, and I, I used to, uh, I used to take phones apart. That was kind of the thing I thought was going to uh, accelerate me into some kind of understanding. Uh, so I'd, I'd take it apart uh, and just I start naming things, no idea what they were at all, and I would just say that's what does that. And I'd go up to my mom and be like, "Look at me, what a, what a brilliant engineer I am." Um, but as, as time went on, as I got into school, you know, you realize you have a bit of a, bit of a thing for math, um, bit of a thing for the more technical sides of things. Um, and you fall in, uh, I personally just fell into a straight up nerd crowd, uh, been there for the rest of the time. Uh, and we would talk about, uh, we would talk about technology. We'd get involved in different robotics clubs. And so, you know, when I was in high school, we had a robotics club where, Yes, the, the idea was make robots, but really it was uh, a, a social group where we would, uh, we would have fun with technology. Um, and that energy propelled me through, uh, went, to, uh, went to Worcester Polytech. Um, and contrary to what many people in this building believe, I actually didn't go in for robotics. I went in for uh, game development, which uh, really, you know, the, we do a lot of design a lot of computer science, uh, some art. Uh, funny thing, whole families in, into education, uh, into helping younger generations, uh, and Apple doesn't fall from, far from the tree. Uh, and I ended up doing this here uh, at Master Robotics. And the translation between a lot of that kind of design background from that technical background to robotics is really smooth. Uh, obviously, I had a, a bit of a background with robotics in high school clubs and such. And so it's been a real pleasure to, to finally be able to come full circle, make my way here and be able to not only educate uh, younger students, but also I get to be around all this awesome technology. I mean, um, where is it? behind me over here, you see a, a Sawyer uh, made by a company called Rethink Robotics. Now, they, were, they went out of business. Um, but that just shows kind of the turnover in the robotics industry right now is massive. And even further behind them, you see a universal robotics arm, uh, and they're kind of that main competitor that took over. We'll see more of a rethink stuff uh, in a little bit, but I want I wanted to show some really cool things that are just kind of out and about in the office as well. So this is an old prototype, an old prototype, from a company called Clio Robotics. And what they do is they make drones, uh, like the kind of quadcopter drones you might see. Uh, 
uh, either either in video production or inspection. They make one of those guys, except instead of this quadcopter, four propellers on each side uh, structure, they went for one duct in the middle. And this one duct allows it to actually maneuver around. Um, this company, like I remember when they, when they built this particular one, uh, it was a couple years ago now, and they built this one, we would see it fly all the time uh, while just walking around the office. And now this is extremely outdated, right? They have slimmed down the entire uh, outside, they've cut out sections, they have removable batteries. Um, and the speed of innovation that's available now between 3D printing, uh, between uh, uh, all the young talent that accumulates in the Boston area, uh, we have really seen them just accelerate through this process. And they're not the only company here that's had such massive amounts of um, progress over time. Uh, we have a company that makes robotic furniture uh, and the furniture just transforms the space. It's not quite as dramatic as you might envision when you hear that, um, but it essentially turns these uh, small apartments you might see in, uh, in city areas, especially in places like Japan, where they got a big contract with Ikea, right? Um, but they transform these small spaces into much larger ones by making that 300 square feet uh, into multiple 300 square foot rooms that can kind of transition between. Um, and we see them, you know, they come in with one product, they uh, expand out and eventually they turn into these really large companies. Uh, another company makes a, an, AI, an AI product uh, and the, the way it works, really, really mind blowing stuff. Uh, I've never, I'd never seen machine learning, uh, machine learning algorithm in person until I stepped foot in here. And they had a couple models mocked up. You can see right on their bench, they have a bunch of electronics uh, uh, going and you don't know what's going on, right? And then you just see this meat looking guy. They would have a freezer full of meat. They would have a computer screen of different types of meat. And you would just watch this machine, flick through each one and slowly start to understand which piece of the meat was what and now they have a whole automated system um, that they, they got contracted to make. They got bought for $7 million. Um, and now they have a whole system that's automatically cutting this meat, inspecting this meat in real time. You know, I think somewhere in Iowa, right? It's just awesome stuff that you get to see every day. Um, however, it really begins much earlier than that because I talked about all those electronics, all that stuff going on. Um, and often parents will come to me and say, how do I, how do I get you know, my kid involved in doing it? Uh, and stuff like this. When we go to events, we have a lot of students come by and say, how do I get into this? Uh, and one of the things we do at Masterbotics is we have workshops with different types of technologies. So this is one of the ones we absolutely adore. Uh, it's a Neuromaker hand. Uh, and we, do the, we use this for a lot of the different um, uh, STEM groups that come through. But the, my favorite part of it, besides the fact that it's a robot and you get the opportunity to build, uh, build this robot, to program this robot, but also inside of all these wires, it looks really complicated. And you come in uh, without any knowledge, you come in and you go, wow, that's complicated. And you learn how to actually do stuff with that. That same technology that's in here is the same stuff you see you know, back there. It's the exact same types of connectors, exact same types of computers, uh, exact same type of information getting passed. And we can get from there to the, uh, from, one, from one extreme to the other, from the no knowledge to the expert in robotics, by going through some really awesome things in the process. Um, th these, guys, these guys have a whole curriculum that's around the biology of the hand all the way to the robotics of the prosthetic hand model here. Uh, and you get to, program different things. You can program this to do sign language, right? Uh, the base of it can be used with a whole bunch of other sensors and stuff, but again, using the same stuff back here. Uh, so it's a really cool, cool way to kind of get that. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a really cool way to kind of get involved in this world. We like to do those particular lessons in this exact space 
for the same kind of effect that you guys get, you know, and you're, you're looking behind me and then I, I turn and there's another robotic arm right behind me, right? Um, and as the day progresses and as people are kind of working on these different projects, I can be really extremely invigorating. Uh, I'm gonna do a weird thing. I'm gonna turn this around real quick. But I wanna show you guys another robot. Ignore the robot that just fell. Um, but right behind, right behind me now, I have this guy. This guy's name is Baxter. Baxter is another one of those red robots like the one that was behind me before from Rethink Robotics. Um, this particular one uh, is a manufacturing arm style robot. Uh, and that's one of the ones you'll see quite a bit around the industry as they have a pretty simple uh, implementation method. And so you see them all over the place. And one of the ideas with a robot like Baxter, unlike uh, the robots of the past, you'd have these really large uh, uh, robots in cages, you know, they'd be manufacturing cars. Now we have a, a lot more things that we're trying to put on the same kind of manufacturing line, some kind of conveyor belt, same kind of assembly processes. But we need people, right? People are extremely flexible. Uh, they're easy to retrain, uh, and so and they have a whole different set of skill sets that machines don't have, right? So in order to fill some of that gap, now we have thing we have robots like this that are made to work alongside people, as opposed to instead of people or in another room uh, than people. That's where collaborative robots came from, like Baxter. Now Baxter has a couple features that make it really uh, uh, workable with people, and the first one is that it's incredibly easy to train. So this robot right here, I control now with this arm. You can see the other arm completely mirrors it. Moving right with me. And so now, despite my own programming background, I wouldn't need that in order to program this, right? Someone has done all the hard work for you, and now all you need is to know what the, uh, what the operation is. So the idea with stuff like this is you have someone who's trained in the operation and can train the robots. And that becomes the new standard for what this kind of job might look like. It's working alongside these robots to do things uh, uh, faster, right? Uh, to do tasks faster, to do them more precise than a human, but maintain some of the flexibility that uh, humans are able to train into the robot. Another feature, uh, you can see I'm very comfortable within the arm space of the robot. Uh, and that's because it has a lot of safety features that make this non-dangerous. So for one, any significant force, and you see this arm over here stop moving, right? It stopped trying to move at all. It didn't go this way, it didn't go that way, right? It neutralized because it knows there's someone there, right? And, the, and as the industry ages, as we get into uh, new types of tech, we're gonna see a lot of these safety features become more and more standard. Um, now, not all arms are like these guys. That sense in the same way. Uh, some arms, uh, instead of sensing something hit it, they sense uh, different amounts of tension in the motors. Uh, so if the motors feel a certain amount of force, they'll let up. Now we have more, more uh, innovative tactics, like one of our old companies, Real-Time Robotics, uh, so they were a company that they had a, they had a, something that was so good that they eventually expanded outside of mass robotics and now have their own separate office. And they do motion planning in real time. So while the strategy of this robot, right, is a fail safe. If something gets in the way, then it stops, right? What real time does is it has a program. Ooh. Small little bug. Restart you. Man, little bug, we won't worry about it. But what they have, instead of the robot deciding after it hits you that it's dangerous, it will plan a whole new motion around avoiding a target entirely, right? So now it won't even stop the task if there's someone in the way. And that's something, again, we, we get to see that kind of develop at mass robotics. Um, I'm gonna move back this way. as we continue this. Uh, but honestly, when I, when I first got here, I never expected 
to have all this extra in-depth uh, knowledge about robotics, right? When I, 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 it was always kind of a passing interest. It was a way to get me engaged in some of the topics that, uh, that were really important to me, like computer science, um, like uh, electronics, um, electrical engineering, circuit, uh, circuit creating, right? Uh, and now, like I said, it really does feel like it came full circle as now I get to be around all of the technology and see that it's not some black box that's not, that you can't understand. Once you break it down into different pieces, uh, you can really engage with it and you realize I can add to this, I can create from this. And the technology has gotten better. We have easier ways to do uh, 3D modeling, different kind of CAD, uh, CAD creations now. Autodesk, instead of just having their really, really expensive, really specialized CAD programs, they have Tinkercad, right, for STEM. Uh, instead of it just being, oh, you need to have all this printed circuit board stuff that's uh, uh, completely custom. Right now, instead, we have things like Arduino, Raspberry Pi, which are cheap. These are 30, 30 to $50 pieces of, of technology that you can buy, add sensors to, find YouTube tutorials of how to work properly, uh, find tons of different very accessible manuals to understand how they work and start building stuff uh, as young as fifth, sixth grade. Uh, the Neuromaker hand uses that Arduino, right? And they go, I, I believe as young as fourth grade, do some awesome stuff with the hand. And that just, it, it's all getting easier. We're getting to a point where uh, you don't even need to have, uh, I had a formalized club, right? You don't need that club anymore. It's always helpful. But if, you, if you're a, a student or you're a parent of a student that wants to get into stuff like this, uh, all you have to do is see some of the resources out there. Go to, um, go to one Lego Mindstorm or first Lego League uh, event, uh, pick up one kit and you can really get going and start seeing some of these concepts in action. And of course, you know, we always will advocate at Masterbotics coming and actually seeing the kind of stuff that we have around here. Uh, it is, there is nothing quite like looking at something uh, after, you've, after you've studied this a little bit, right? Uh, when we have a, a workshop here, you know, we might say, okay, when we build the robotic hand behind it, right? We'll take a look at this and we'll, we'll look at the individual digits, the way this hand actually operates, the way that you pull this string down and the whole thing curves. And then we'll go to a company that's making uh, a similar type of product and they use the exact same mechanics. Um, when we had the NASA Valkyrie robot here, uh, we would show them the digits of the $3 million, uh, 300 pound NASA robot used the rubber band to control it, to uh, flex its fingers, right? That's an awesome moment to realize that this technology is right in your fingertips, all right there. If you can just get your foot in the door, get to see some of the possibilities, uh, you can start making your own stuff. And it's awesome that we've come to that point. Um, I'm really curious uh, uh, with, the, with the group we have here, if there are any questions about uh, what it's like here, what it's like growing up, you know, learning, learning STEM as that's become the standard now, uh, what it's like coming into this world now. I'm, I'm really curious as to, uh, what you guys are curious about. I will say, uh, when we first started this up, uh, I'm, I'm calling you out, Aaron, because <laughs> you first started this up, just, uh, this, this is super relevant. Uh, I actually worked at a, a, a different summer camp uh, thing back in high school. And uh, Aaron, uh, he was the uh, either like assistant camp director or became the camp director. Uh, and that was teaching STEM stuff. So I learned a lot of soldering and electronics actually while I was at that, uh, I was teaching at that particular camp. So it's awesome that, you know, we, we, again, we, we're just coming full circle with this whole, this whole thing. Amazing. Thank you so much, Cleef. This presentation was absolutely fantastic. Uh, we at EF are so, so grateful for this partnership with Mass Robotics and all the amazing experiences that you've been able to give our students. Uh, I thought this presentation had some fantastic advice for young learners. 
um, some awesome tips for getting involved in the world of robotics. And I really encourage all of our listeners, anyone at home, to visit Mass Robotics if you are able to. Uh, we've received some really awesome questions for Khalif, and I encourage you all to keep submitting them to us. Uh, but just to start out, uh, this question is, what is your favorite robot and why, Khalif? Oh, so that, that's a super easy one. In fact, I, I, I brought it out. It was one of the ones I brought. It was this guy right here. Uh, or at least the newer version of this guy right here. Um, and it was one of the first things that I was able to see really go from it barely flew to where it is now. It is incredibly awesome. They catch it out the air like, you know, like it's a, a well, a donut. Like, you know, it's a, they call it a dronut. It's very cute. But um, not, only, not only getting to see this, the fact that it's a drone, we see a lot of uh, drones out these days, and yet this one, this one is so different. It looks extremely sci-fi, and I'm excited every time they do a flight test. Um, I do have another favorite robot, uh, just because you know we, we have we have all the things around here. Uh, my uh, my other favorite robot uh, is uh, oh my goodness, I wonder is it in the shot? It's not in the shot, uh, but my other favorite robot is. Uh, one of one of the robotic arms uh, that has another. It also has instead of the grippers. You can't really see the grippers here, but most of the grippers kind of close like this, uh, or they flex together, um, like the uh, prosthetic hand does. Um, but this one has like three little finger digits, so it look it, it look and it moves with some extra. Um, uh, it has some extra joints in it, so that it has this natural flowing movement. That's super mesmerizing to see when people do some interesting programming things with. Always, always love that. Very, very cool. I love the name Dronet. I think that is very <laughs> clever for that little robot. Uh, when you have middle and high school students visit Mass Robotics, do you have favorite projects that you like to do with them, to teach them, favorite robots you like to show off? Yeah, um, I mean, well, favorite to show off. Always will show off Baxter, the one I showed off right here. Uh, that. Part of, part of the experience is getting comfortable with, uh, with robotics, with robots, getting comfortable like touching, feeling, experiencing. And Baxter is one of the easiest ones to start with. Uh, it's made to work with people and it still fulfills that uh, to this day where they get to control a robot and see how uh, with, with good design, with good concepts, you know, you can make something that's easy to use. And then, you know, we move right on to whatever workshop we're doing uh, and they get to do the exact same thing, but from the other side, right? And getting both sides of that is just, I mean, that's what makes, that's what makes this kind of education really exciting. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Now you mentioned a lot of resources for students, again, interested in getting into robotics. You talked about like the availability of YouTube tutorials, yeah. um, affordability of building things using Arduino. Uh, for students who maybe have an idea, something that they wanna create, What's sort of the first step that they should take if they want to make that idea a reality? Well, luck luckily, there's, there's, a, there's a process of invention uh, <laughs> that you can actually look up. There are tons of diagrams of them out there on the internet. Um, but it, uh, it does all start with the idea and just start writing down what are the elements of that. Uh, when, I, when I have something, I write down what are the different pieces of it. Uh, and then I just start looking, what do I know how to do? What don't I know how to do? And then if there's anything you don't know how to do, like, okay, let's say I was making, you know, myself a little robotic arm, draw, you know, write down what it should do. You know, and then I write down like what it should, I sketch what it will look like. Um, and then part of that, the thing that will come up is, okay, I need to get a, a motor to drive one of the things. How do I do that, right? So let me look up motors for mechanical arms or something, right? Or, oh, I need to 3D print uh, a piece of it. Do I know how to 3D print? No write that down, and now that becomes a skill you know you can learn. Uh, and you'll find that you'll start going down this list, you'll start learning more, then you'll look at your original thing and go, oh, I know a better version of this now. Because you're starting to learn everything you need. Uh, and then uh, the, the, the final piece is sticking with it. When, when it seems like nothing's working, you don't know what's going on, stick with it. Nothing is like completing your first project, and you need to complete. You, you have to keep pushing through. 
because that's kind of the the soul of a lot of a lot of engineering. Uh, it, in the in the weeds, it will get difficult, and you have to keep pushing through that uh, and solving problems one by one. And you'll get to this point where you you solve the hardest problem, and then as you get closer and closer and closer and closer, you see the problem set just ticking them off, and then you have the final thing. I'm telling you, there's nothing like it. Fantastic advice, not just for robotics, but also for life, I would say. Uh, you mentioned too that, you know, in your background, you haven't just studied robotics. Um, you've looked at design, you've looked at sort of more, I guess, artistic ways of expression. So I'm curious, you know, I think some people might have the misconception that working with robots is just um, super STEM heavy, maybe just coding. How do you sort of see like the creative artistic side of your brain being used? Yeah, uh, so I have several things about that. First, when we think about robotics, we tend to think in a very small bubble of, of uh, things. You know, you see the, I keep going the wrong side. You see the robotic arms and you're like, okay, robotic arm, that seems like a robot. You, you might think of a, a movie version. You might think, you know, a human or robot. And you're like, I kind of get it. Uh, robotics spans so much wider than you'd think and so many more industries than you'd think. Um, and all the associated skills kind of come with that. So just like as a, as, as, a, as a basic uh, showcase of kind of the, the breadth of robotics, you know, there's manufacturing robotics, there's construction robotics, there's agricultural robotics, there's healthcare robotics, right? We have startups in all of these fields. Uh, there is a, a whole video on YouTube that I was getting passed around about a robot doing surgery on a grape. And that was, you know, it's a big meme, but like that was really impressive stuff, right? Uh, and that stuff is happening right now. And so because of all these industries, Every other skill is it can be important to a different piece of robotics. Uh, all of this kind of it all comes together because robotics is kind of a support industry for uh, pretty much anything that involves interaction with the real world. And it, we'll see it more and more. I mean, cars are becoming more robotic, right? Houses are becoming more robotic. Uh, that's half of your life is in one of those two things, right? Um, uh, and then also from a from a design element as well, like. Uh, I, I point out, I, I wish I could get a little closer, but there, there, there are two robots back here. One of these is a collaborative robot and one's not. And one thing that I talk about is you can actually tell the difference between a collaborative robot and a non-collaborative robot by their design, right? And someone, someone has to actually go through that entire design process and figuring out how do I make this not only work well, but serve its purpose working with people, which means it needs to be approachable by people. That has different design language. Uh, it needs to not only have a, a programming element that makes it avoid people or stop when there are people there, but it can't have pinch points, right? Where someone's hair might get caught or someone's shirt might get caught. And you'll notice collaborative robots have fewer of those. And so there's so many of these things that if you get comfortable and that's really another hallmark of roboticists is how general your skill set tends to get because you're not just dealing with the program, you're dealing with the physical hardware, you're dealing with the design, and then on top of that, you're inventing something new, right? So all the different has come together, and that's, that's robotics. It's very hard to define, it's hard to teach, because it's, it's technology, it's kind of hitting all of them. Um, it's also why it's a great place to start. Fantastic, yeah, there's just so much more depth to the industry that I think people realize, so it's really great to hear from that different perspective. Uh, and just our final question, this is a good one. Are you ever afraid that robots could take over the world? Not in the slightest. Uh, and you know, it, it, it's a, uh, I mean, it, it's until, until you get to see people making robots and, and realize how, um, I mean, for lack of a better term, for how dumb robots really are, we tell them what to do. Uh, every single robot here has an e-stop, you press it, it just goes dead. And that's, you know, one of safety condition that Literally every robot, every heavy piece of machinery will have one of those. Uh, and you know, and honestly, they're, they're not gonna take over, we're good. We're good. <laughs> okay, on that reassuring note, I wanna thank you again, Cleve, uh, for your time and for this amazing presentation. I'll turn it over to Darby. No, oh, absolutely. Thank you to everyone at home and in schools around the nation for joining us. We hope it was enlightening and that you all learned a lot. I know I did. So fascinating, Khalif. So big thank you to you and to Mass Robotics for this amazing partnership. Kate, for being such a great co-pilot and everyone 
Um, just have a wonderful STEM day. Thanks for joining us. Bye, everyone.